Shh. And wait a minute. What's on the ground over there? Some smoked mackerel. Mm, put it in the canteen freezer. Illegal. Not... Market evidence so nobody eats it. Illegal. And then give it to Nico to do that. Illegal. Illegal. <laughs> okay, I'll stop. I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> Welcome to Midsummer Maniacs. Hey, Maniacs. I'm one of your Maniac hosts, Sarah. And I'm your other Maniac host, Mark. And this is episode 13 of Midsummer Maniacs, and today we're covering season three, episode four of Midsummer Murders. Beyond the Grave. It's a good one. Yes, absolutely. Just a reminder, if you let your kids watch the show, they should be fine to listen to the podcast, but if the show is too much for them... The podcast certainly is. Give me your one sentence, gut response, favorite thing, summary of this episode. My one what's thing? Your, what's your takeaway as a maniac? My takeaway of, as a maniac is this is Barnaby busting the ghosts. <laughs> Ghost busting Barnaby. I thought you were going to say... Breaking the law, breaking the law. Well, so we'll get to that. Because <laughs> when we were rewatching this episode to make some notes recently, you kept going on about them breaking the law. Okay, we're just going to say this right off the top. <laughs> I'm not expecting Midsummer Murders to be a police procedural, but the amount of times that they flagrantly break the law in this episode is nuts. It is, but it's fun. It is. But I like your I like your Barnaby busting ghosts. Yeah, absolutely. I like it when he's very skeptical and and like doesn't believe in the supernatural and stuff. I love that stuff. I like it when he's aggressive and tricksy. Yes. I also do that. <laughs> Which he so. does in this episode yep. too. So this is filmed in September and October ninety eight, uh, which is early actually. So they filmed this one long before the other ones. And in this series and broadcast date on the 5th of February year 2000 and uh, 94 million views. The fact that this was shot out of sequence explains Joyce's bad hair. It also explains another thing, which I'll get to when we talk about location. Her hair. So in the last episode, in Judgment Day and in Blue Herring both, her hair is kind of okay. And then it reverts to this bad helmet it's, hair. And I'm like, no, it, Joyce. It's just hideous. But it makes sense if this was shot before the good hair came in. And this is the episode, I think, that was actually directed by Maura Armstrong, who is the Scottish lady who does television. Mm. And uh, written by Douglas Watkinson. It takes place in Aspern Tallow. Another Aspern Tallow episode. Just like Blue Herrings. Yeah. And I'm saying Aspern Yes. Tallow, because there's controversy. Yes. But before we begin, we are recording this baby on the 11th of October, 2019, and it is John Nettles' 75th birthday. Happy birthday, happy, Mr. Nettles. Happy birthday, John. My to, favorite detective. Yep. <laughs> Tom Barnaby is fantastic. If only he would listen. Maybe he does. Who knows? Who knows? If you're out there, Tom, we love you. Exactly. <laughs> All well, right. Let's get going. Okay, yes, it takes place in Aspern Tallow, and we start with the cold open, which is basically a tour put on by the museum run by Alan Bradford. And he's like running. He says running, but he never actually runs. Yeah, but he hustles. He hustles. And but the six people on the tour who are, for some reason, all weighed down with random baggage and cameras and backpacks and notebooks and they look more like one person reporter teams than tourists. Yes. They're they're chuffing along behind him. And he's telling the story of Jonathan Lowry, which is a Civil War hero in the Battle of Aspern Tallow. 1591 to 1644. That happened in 1644. I double checked there was not a battle of Aspern yeah. Tallow in, <laughs> in the in the English Civil, Civil War in 1644. And in the midst of them getting his dramatic recreation of the battle in the battlefield. Here comes Miss Bunsell on her trike. 
<laughs> yeah, that trike is awesome. I, I love Miss Bunzel, everything about her. But every time I see her cycling at fast speed, I just, I hear the Wicked Witch of the West music in the background, like, dun, 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 you know? <laughs> and she's like, get out of the way, I'm coming through. Not like, pardon me. Nope. Uh, <laughs> I guess they're on the road. She's weird in that she's somewhat rude, but then she's really, like, she cares about people. She's and kind of awesome. She's a bad medium. Yeah. We'll get to that. She's not a good but, psychic, but she seems like a good person. Yes, I would agree. Uh, so they arrive at the museum in Aspen Hall. Now, Aspen Hall is exactly the same set they used in Judgment Day for Greyfire Friars. Ah. It's the same building. Interesting. And the village green they use in this episode, exactly. This is really the same location as... Judgment Day. Judgment Day. So it's Aspern. Yes. And the fact that you bring up Judgment Day reminds me, speaking of Ms. Bunsell and her trike. So she's played by Prunella Scales. Prunella, oh. She has a great name. That's a tough name. She can handle it. Okay. Yeah. She's married and has been for forever to Timothy West, who played Marcus Devere in Judgment uh, Day. That's right. So in real life, they're married. She also played Map in Map and Lucia. I don't know if you've ever seen that. No, I've oh, never it's seen. great. It's a good show. And she was Sybil Faulty in Faulty Towers, which is where I recognized her from. The first time I saw this episode, I'm like, I know that lady. Now, is she the wife in Faulty Towers or the mm-hmm. mother in law? Wife. The wife. Yeah. Okay. I'm like, I know her, that face. Where do I know that face from? I watched. And that's where. I watched all of Faulty Towers once when, like, the first moment I could. Yeah. And I haven't seen it since. Oh. And because Prunella Scales was on Faulty Towers. One of her bestest friends is John Cleese. That's good. Of course, unfortunately, as of today anyway, she has very bad Alzheimer's. Oh, that's Shortly sad. after this episode, actually, she kind of got serious with it. John Cleese would be a good guest star on this show. Yeah, he would. He, he would be great. We should start a petition. Excellent idea. <laughs> you know who else is all over this episode? Our dude, Constable Angel. He is. Like He's he, one he of the guys. Speaks. He's one of the guys in the tour group. Yeah. And this is why Alan, when they find the painting's been all cut up, he goes, you're a policeman, do something. Because the portrait of Jonathan Lowry has been defaced. Literally. Defaced, I know. Like I am cut through the yeah, face. I know <laughs> I am obsessed with the minutia of this show. That's all right. That's why you're a maniac. Particularly the newspapers <laughs> in this show. Mm-hmm. Now, the boy who brings the newspaper to the Barnabys brings the Daily Record. Okay. What the hell newspaper is that? And where is my Costin Echo? Maybe the Costin Echo went out of business. It shows up in the next episode. <laughs> Maybe they take more than one newspaper. Maybe. I don't know. The kid clearly has a bag that says Daily Record. Uh, maybe he borrowed the bag. Maybe. <laughs> but Nico's back. <laughs> the boyfriend who kind of doesn't exist unless it's convenient. Well, wherever he's been, he's been well fed. <laughs> yes, he's got kind of a chubby chipmunk face in this episode. But that's okay. He's still like bright and eager and shiny and happy. And he's going to stay with them for two whole weeks. Because they have a part of the soap. Yeah, which is going to pay more than Troy makes. But Yeah, that I think that's one of the, my favorite lines of the episode is when Troy goes, he's getting paid more to pretend me than I get for being me. Yeah. <laughs> he's going to shadow Troy because he's going to play a sergeant in a soap opera. So he's going to learn. And then we get, um, we get Sandra McKillop. Yes. Who's going to come and restore the painting. But before that, we have rule one. Oh, keep the governor waiting. Keep the go- so the there's these rules that Tom is gonna give Nico. Yeah, to help him with his role. And the first one is always keep the governor waiting. Yeah, because Troy's always a little bit late, right? Yeah, and Cully's like treating him like she's the wife, right? Of course. Don't forget your lunch. Whatever. We never see Nico again <laughs> after this episode. No, clearly rule twenty eight is don't do this. Yeah. <laughs> Rule twenty nine is get rid of Nico. Yeah, this is his. Uh, this is his last appearance. So we meet Sandra and Charles McKillop. Charles runs a software company that makes software. Yeah, and that's what it does. He's Sandra's brother in law. She was married to his brother David, who's yes. dead. Do David we ever find the light departed? Do we ever find out how he actually died? No, and he says, uh, Charles says, it's not like he would ever take his life. 
it surprised me. I'm like, why are we not investigating yeah, that? Yeah, really. Murder? If they, like, was it a suicide? Wasn't a suicide? Do they think it was, but it wasn't? Like, it's like, oh, well, he's just dead. Okay, Charles and his heroin chic girlfriend are crazy enough to try to dra- drive Sarah, uh, drive Sandra nuts. They're crazy enough to have killed David. No, because I think Charlie's actually sorry that David's dead because I think David was a valuable asset to the business. Mm-hmm. Whatever it does. He, it they makes, make software. It makes software that displays the name McKillop. McKillop. It's, that was a big thing back then. That was fancy. It was. People would pay for that. I guess. <laughs> Charlie is like um, painting up a room for Sandra to have a studio because she's an artist. And so she gets called over to Aspern Hall to restore the painting that's been cut up. By Alan. And there's some nice interplay between Charles and her here. Yeah. Which is good because he he's... Not treating her right in reality. No, but at this point, it's as if her brother-in-law is being very caring towards her because she's clearly had some kind of nervous breakdown after her husband died. Yes. She's fragile, right? Rule two, always treat the boss as if he is blind and stupid. Which Troy definitely follows. Absolutely. <laughs> since the very beginning, since the first episode. Here, sir, here's the body. <laughs> and Thanks, Angel's Troy. all over this again. <laughs> Angel is like... He earned his pay in this episode. Well, and you and I talked about this, and I'm I'm curious as to what listeners think. I he is very present in this episode. He has speaking parts. He comes to the Burnaby's house at There's the end. There's a backstory. Yeah, and we, I think you know you and I both wondered either they were kind of playing around with him being the next sergeant, or what I thought was maybe they were toying with having a constable, as, uh, like a detective constable, as like a third person in the team Maybe. and somehow they realized they didn't want to do that but so, after this episode much like nico they get the boot maybe they ran off together maybe maybe it's a possibility of course tom and troy and nico show up at the hall at the museum because they've been called because the painting has been defaced yeah and so they've come to investigate and there's this cute little scene where troy and nico are sitting on the on Jonathan Lowry's grave on his slab and there. And he goes reading the Greek. Well, you don't know that, right? You know. There's this little kind of just flash of the two of them sort of kneeling on it, looking very interested and like pointing at it like, oh, here are letters on stone. Look, yes, yes I see I should letters read this. on stone. Very interesting. So <laughs> then Sandra looks at the painting and says, can I work here? And they have a copy of the painting as a postcard. And then... So there is this weird, I love extreme close-ups part of this episode. Because mm. we go to extreme close-ups of Sandra's eyes, extreme close-ups of the of the painting's eyes, extreme close-ups of Sandra's eyes, like over and over again. It's a, it's a little too much. Well, it's supposed to make us feel like there's some neuroticism going on there, right? Yeah. They do address this at one point, but just this is like a little passing, but whatever. She's lived in this village for a long time, if not her whole life. She's very familiar with that painting. Yes. And this is the first time she's like, have you ever noticed this looks exactly like my husband? It's all weird suggestion. And and if that's what her husband looked like, you know, he's, he's not a, an attractive man. It's just the eyes. It's just the eyes. Just the creepy zoomed in eyes. Well, Tom has no patience for any of it and says basically they should have had a security system and let's file it under forget. But, but Troy, did you notice something in there? A smell? It smelled like fish. And wait a minute, what's on the ground over there? Some smoked mackerel. Mm, Put it in the canteen freezer, illegal. Not... Market evidence so nobody eats it. Illegal. And then give it to Nico. To do that. Illegal. Illegal. (laughs) Okay, I'll stop. I'll stop. I'll stop. (laughs) So we get this this red herring of mackerel, right? That (laughs) it's literal fish fish red herring. Red herring, yes. So the the museum smells like fish, and here's some fish. Isn't that weird? Somebody dropped their shopping. Oh well. Troy and Nico are like, no crime. It's just a stupid painting. Whatever. Meanwhile, Tom, there's something yep. going on. There's yep. something going on. Yep. Then we're introduced to Annie and Jim, who I actually like Annie a lot. I don't. Okay. 
<laughs> she and her minxy wink are guilty of something. Oh, I didn't know they were guilty of something. Well, first we're going to see that uh, George Burton, the gangster also known as Four Inch. Yeah, what does that mean? Has died. Is that a, a Britishism that we're not getting? You know, I looked around. I looked at a lot of gangster nicknames, a lot of British gangster nicknames to see if I could find any that were like inch related. No. Hmm. Also, Michelle's having a baby. It doesn't look anything like her husband. Well, there is that. <laughs> um, I did find a British gangster called Taffy. Taffy? Yeah. Oh, that's not a bad name. It's more flattering than four inch. Yes. Which I, I can only think of as an insult. George, four <laughs> inch burden. Like, sorry, dude. Barnaby sees the newspaper and also Jim. Sees the newspaper. Is looking at the newspaper. Now the newspaper too. that Jim reads has another story in it. Jim by, Tate. Called Taking a Shine to Cars That Stay Glossy by Michael Hanlon. This is another segment of Mark Looks at Newspapers Very Closely. And what I, I was like, who's Michael Hanlon? And originally the characters in Written in Blood, the father and Liam, their last name's Hanlon, but no one's named Michael. No, so there's no so it's connection. just a common somebody name. just made up a name. Yep. Troy gives Nico some advice about looking after your governor, and it, we find out Alan Bradford has some form. He's got a record. He does. He's not just a curator. It's on a facsimile transmission. At least it's not from Denmark. No. <laughs> they did get a fax. And Jim, who we learn is a trustee of the museum, goes to the museum to find out what's going on. And there's been a donation. A suit of armor from Champaign, Illinois. All the way from Champaign, Illinois. <laughs> So now Sandra's alone in the museum, right? She's working on the painting. Yeah. Now. She appears to know what she's doing, though. Yeah. They gave her some good ideas. Sort of. But we've watched the art detectives. Yes, we have. And we know that they use very bright light. And they don't put stuff in their mouths. Full spectrum light. Yep. And that you wouldn't just be checking it with a great big magnifying glass. But I will. That's what Sandra does. She seems to do a good job. So there's a wind. Oh. And then more extreme extreme close-ups. It rocks all the banners in the the hall. Yes. And then then the rocking chair is moving on its own. (gasps) On its own? Sandra goes full freak out for the first time in this episode. My note says... Wow, she sure can scream. And she screams <laughs> Alan's name like like it has 16 syllables. Alan! <laughs> the chair! So I, I thought you said she was better. She's not better. She's not better. <laughs> I took a close look at the banners moving in the wind, okay? Yep. There's a couple of ways they could have done this. They could have actually had like some, some wind blowing up there. They might have had a fan or yep. something like that. But when I watched the scene again... Yeah. There's two rows of banners, right? Running down each end side of the hall. Yeah. I noticed they're not moving together. Oh. Right? So I think what they did was they hung them kind of like on a rack. If you can imagine like a yeah. rack at the top with a string connecting the racks on one side and a different string connecting the racks on the other side. And they were just kind of pulling them or jiggling them or something. Somebody jiggling some wire. Yeah. Some wire, stick, whatever. It works. I'm not, I'm not knocking it. It works. And the rocking chair, not in this scene, but in the last scene, you can see the line. Yeah. But still, I don't care. It doesn't, it doesn't damage it for me. It's still good. So Sandra freaks out. And one of the things she does is go to see Charles. And while she goes to see Charles, again, minutia, she goes up the stairs and we're seeing this through windows. And then it pans across a computer screen that says McKillop's. Oh, that's right. Because she's going into the software company, which is like on the second floor of a building, right? Or what they would say the first floor in the UK. And it's just weird how it's... It's like super close to that monitor too. Yeah, it's super close. And it goes over it so fast, I slowed it down to make sure it said McKillop. It just says, this is a ultra modern business. Look, lots of glass and people looking busy in front of huge monitors. Yep. Sign really, some stuff. That's what we did all in the 90s anyway. Is that what it was like? Yes. Wow. You just looked busy in front of a monitor? Yes. Well, she's got to sign some stuff because she and Charles are the co-owners of the business since her husband died. You should go see Linda Marquis. Speaking of words not pronounced correctly. Marquis. Shouldn't she be Marquis? She should be Marquis. But she's Marquis. Marquis. Which sounds much nastier. I agree. Quis. Blech. <laughs> but she's blech. 
So then there's more shooting through windows. I think Moira likes to shoot through windows. That's okay. That's okay. Linda Marquis has a, a, a mantra for Sandra. Well, I think before we get to the mantra, I think we should reveal the name of her therapy agency, which should be Giant Wicker Chair Therapy. Yeah, it, it should be conservatory therapy. Like, that's... Sit here amongst the jungle plants. It's not like any therapy office I've ever seen <laughs> no. or been part of. <laughs> well, she's running out of her house, right? David Delight departed. Let's talk about that first. Say it like you mean it. David Delight <laughs> departed. Let's talk about this mantra for a second. I understand the point of the mantra, right? Yep. They're saying Sandra has got to face the fact that David is dead. Yes. She's had trouble facing that. While we're poisoning you. She's had trouble admitting that he's dead. She can't say it. And really. It's tough for her. Making you freak out about it. What's the delight about? I don't know. It's the 3D mantra. They call it 3D. I'm like, it's not 3D. It's audio. (laughs) Why not? Like, Dear David Departed. Dear David Departed might be a good one. The delight. I love you a lot. Yeah. And I've never said, Delight. You're my delight. Yeah. <laughs> but they're gaslighting her, so I'm... Yeah, yeah. but you, you have to think that she had some part in creating that mantra for herself. That's the whole reason why a mantra works. Maybe. You can't just give somebody a mantra. They have to develop it themselves. That's why it works. But while we're talking about Marquis... Yep. She's played by, ready for it, mm-hmm. Sylvestra Latuzel. Wow. <laughs> That's quite the name. It's an awesome name. She's married to Owen Teal. Now, I'm not saying that her entire career is defined by who she's married to. No. Not at no. all. But she's married to another actor who is interested, interesting to us, Owen Teal. And I'll say one word and you'll know exactly who he is. Are you ready? Yeah. Chaka Block. Oh, <laughs> So Owen Teal is in um, an episode of Lewis. Yeah. Where he, he plays. He plays this former gangster who, who wrote like, a book. Who wrote a book. And like three times in the episode, he's interviewed about the internet being full of thieves. And he says, it's just chock-a-block of thieves. Chock-a-block. But he's also um, Alice or Thurn in Game of Thrones. Yep. And he plays Mel Kirby in Second Sight, which is a Midsummer from 05. Yep. But the best thing about Sylvestra Latuzel, yep. besides her name, yeah. is that she is super famous for this Heineken ad that she did in 1985. Well, now I'm going to find that at my Heineken You're going to have to, because she plays this actress who is in the Street Credibility Agency. Okay. Right? Where she's supposed to be learning how to pronounce things Okay. As if she's from the streets. Okay. But she looks like a friend of Princess Diana. She's okay. got pearls and yeah. a little headband on. And what she's supposed to say is, the water in Majorca don't taste like what it oughta, right? Okay. That's how she says it. The water in Majorca don't taste like what it ought to. Yes. Then she has a drink Heineken. Okay. And then she's like, the water in Majorca don't taste like what it oughta. <laughs> And it's just like this infamous commercial. It's very funny. I'll find it. I'm sure you'll find it. That's Sylvester Latuzel. Excellent. Jim also has a whole bunch of stories about George. So clearly Jim and George are somehow connected here. It, it, Jim is concerned about 4-inch. Yes. Because he's got a whole coffee table of newspaper clippings about 4-inch. He's got more than 4 inches of 4-inch stories. And he decides to go see Annie, who is making the world's most disgusting food. Okay, let's talk about Annie for a second. Okay. She's this tiny little woman. Yep. And she winks at Troy every time she sees him. And she uses her whole face to wink. It's... it's <laughs> It's exaggerated wink 101. She's very sweet yep. and Quaritch, played by Patricia Blake, who's also in Let Us Pray. It's a 2014 episode with John Barnaby instead okay. of Tom. So Ann Quaritch was in this awesome TV show that was only on the air for a year called The Ugliest Girl in Town. Wow. She's not the ugliest girl in town. Ann Quaritch does not play the ugliest girl in town. The ugliest girl in town is her boyfriend. Okay. Okay. Who is an American who wants to go to London so he can see her. Okay. So he cross dresses to be in a commercial for his brother's business. And a London talent agent sees him and thinks she's the most beautiful woman ever and brings her to London on a modeling contract. Wow. (laughs) That is 
That is a stretch. And I and will have to find and episodes. And he is a of hideous that. woman. Okay, I'm this, sure there's he like is. no effort gone to to make him look attractive. Yeah. But Ann Quaritch plays his girlfriend Julie in that, and she's so super cute in the whole show. She's got like a little like the straw boater and the bow tie, and she's like oh. super adorable. But wow, when I found that hole, I went all the way down that hole. <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> Because she's beautiful. Yep. So I thought, is she the, uh, that's horrible. They're calling no. her the ugliest girl in town. No. Oh, no, 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 no. So Jim comes over to see Annie, who is very happy about this. She loves him. She does. And he she loves wants to do her. kissy, kissy with well, him. Well, he wants to take her away to his house in France. Yes. Because he just wants to run, get out of town. Yeah, because he knows what's coming. Mm-hmm. The, uh, he's in her place after she's dumped that can of pilchards into a bowl i don't know what she's making this section in my notes is called yuck (laughs) yuck food no just yuck she's definitely into the fish yeah and she covers it for a couple of reasons we know she should definitely put a tea towel over that yeah when they're together and they're talking though they hear the bell ring and the bell in the church going ding dong is a sign that jonathan bellry's um lowry's ghost is about Yes, and Alan Bradford goes to the museum. Well, and Jim runs out into the dark and gets punched. No, Alan gets punched. Oh, my notes are wrong then. Yeah, Alan gets punched. Yeah, he gets punched in the dark, you're right. And then Nico is at the breakfast table. Mm-hmm. He's sitting in Tom's place. That's unacceptable. Nope, nope. And Alan's alive. Like, at first you think maybe Alan's dead, but he just got punched. Yeah, because you're waiting for somebody to die. Yeah, because it's quite a while in here, and still he's not dead. But we're entertained by all these weird characters. So yes. Okay. And he's spicy again once to all of them, right? <laughs> she winks at Troy. You can't wink in audio, but uh, uh, yeah. big wink. Alan has this great line because uh, Eleanor goes, what would your mother say? <laughs> and Alan goes, leave me alone. I haven't been, I've been dead for 10 years. <laughs> and then Eleanor says... Dead is an unword. Yeah, her unwords. That's just fantastic. Don't forget, she rides up on her tricycle at Mach 10 with poor 90 year old Marcus Lowry running behind her with his dog, Spots. I'm sorry, tricycle is an unword. <laughs> Unword is an unword. Well, illegal is an unword for this episode. Well, he's the great grandson times 10 of Jonathan Lowry, and he wants no. to know where the family money is. Well, it's hidden in Aspirin Town Hall, Hall Museum, right? which we see the sign for, and we see that Alan Bradford, which I don't actually think so, has an MA. Yeah, I buy that. He knows what he's talking about. I guess so. Yeah. But while they're standing around in the museum, the box from Champaign, Illinois, well, bef- explodes into the, flame. The box goes on fire. But before that, we have the worst. Eleanor is a medium in the sense that she yells at ghosts. Well, she also holds her hands out. Yes. She also, and it's all theatric, right? We have a late entrance. It's all performative. Uh, but then the box goes on fire. Maybe she did it. Sandra. She's a witch. Takes off again. <laughs> She doesn't just like, oh my, I'm so upset I have to get out of here. She runs like she's on fire. Ah And her long ankle-length sweater blowing behind her. She should have just jumped on Eleanor's tricycle and pedaled away. Yeah. So Barnaby gives Troy a choice here. He says, you can talk to Bunsel or you can talk to Alan Bradford. And Troy says, okay, I'll talk to Alan Bradford. Bradford. And and Barnaby goes, okay, I'll go talk to Alan Bradford. You talk to Mrs. Bunsel. So Alan has a record, and his record is that he once stole a bust of Oliver Cromwell. For the love of Cromwell. Worth $13,000. Six months in jail, man. Yeah, and uh, Barnaby makes a joke that he's no Brinks Matt type. Yeah, what did that mean? So Brinks Matt is a warehouse robbery that happened in 1983. Six guys armed broke Mm. into a warehouse, and what they were hoping to get was $3 million. Yeah. What they actually found was $26 million worth of gold bullion. Kazam. And got away with it. There were dirty words spoken at that particular moment. Well, and and to this day, most of that money, uh, most of the gold has never been recovered. 
Oh, okay. They kind of understand that it's probably been melted. Yeah. Right? So not only was it, it's like the great train robbery kind of thing, right? It's this big heist. But not only is it this big heist, but what it's better known for now is that a huge number of people who were involved, even tangentially, have all died horrible deaths since. Oh, like accidents in quotation oh no 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 like they've been gunned down in the street oh okay one guy was killed on his yacht one guy was axed in the head that's brutal yeah so So, it'd be worth about 500 million dollars in today's money that's 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 a they're saying that alan bradford's no yeah no real thief meanwhile troy accuses eleanor of being a pyromaniac (laughs) do i look like a pyromaniac well, maybe. <laughs> and Nico lets it slip that he understands ancient Greek, and it says, here lies Jonathan Lowry and his worldly goods. And this is just one example of Nico actually being really smart in this episode. He's helpful. And Troy says, there's just nutters and more nutters. <laughs> there are nutters and more nutters. So, so- they, they go to see Charles, and Tom says probably one of my favorite lines of the entire show. Not this sh- not this episode, but of the entire show. So this is Tom, Tom Troy, yes. Charlie, and Sandra in the garden having drinks, right? Yeah, and Tom says, I don't believe in ghosts, just people with dark motives. I, s- I want to put that on a shirt. That's just fantastic. Dark motives. It's just awesome. Then Sandra... Goes into her neurotic act. Is that a crime? <laughs> she stands up. I need some lemonade. Her ankle length sweater is off one shoulder. So I resent she looks that. all disheveled. And then she holds a glass with both hands. Gotta get the lemonade to my lips. And then she takes off and then again. She's like, Run away. Ah! I've known grief stricken people. They didn't do that. Why is she like that? Uh, it's because of David's death and she's loony. Tom says, why is she like she is? Which, say it to yourself and realize what a confusing sentence yes. it is. Why is she like she is? Uh, it's suggested that David took his own life. He left a gap and that uh, the only person that Sandra really connects with is Eleanor, the writer of Broomstick. Yeah, because Charlie is supposed to be like her savior taking good care of her. But Eleanor, they don't say it, but I always got the impression that Eleanor was a school teacher. That she's a retired so. school teacher. And anybody who went to school, they either loved her or they hated her. And she, Sandra's one of the ones who loved she her. She makes reference to school teaching at one point. She just acts like a school teacher. No, I think she makes reference to, to pupils. And one-sided conversations. That's right. When she talks about how she communicates with the dead, which is nothing like she does in the first half of the story, <laughs> that, that it's like talking to pupils. Oh, well, that would make sense then. Uh, Jim and Annie are sneaking around the museum with a metal detector. Now, I looked this up. A metal detector will detect metal through a slab of stone. Oh, will? Or concrete. No okay, problem. That's good. Because at first I'm like, really? The thing goes work? off like crazy. Yeah. But we've also now, by this point, seen Ralph in the basement. Yes. Scurrying around like Ratman. But we don't know who Ralph is yet. No, we don't. If I'm a policeman and I'm a boss, a governor, say, mm-hmm. and I have a subordinate, mm-hmm. right? Is it kosher for me to put that subordinate in a way of harm in which he might get burned? Say? Yes. Oh, Okay. Yeah, them's the rules. Okay. (laughs) You can embarrass your subordinate. You can hurt them, but you just can't leave any lasting damage. Okay, because Barnaby takes Troy's hand and puts it in the sunlight and burns it. (laughs) I don't think he burned. He rubs his hand a little bit later, but he's all right. There's another therapy session in which nothing really happens. But, wow, I really want a therapist who asks me in the middle of a session, do you feel the need to prove that you're not going mad? (laughs) I have that in my notes. Exactly. Like, what kind of therapist says that? <sighs> my voice just, just went so high in shock. Like, it, it's like it's like your doctor going, you know you're going to die, right? No, wait a minute. Maybe not. Like, what? What? Yeah. <laughs> you so, have cancer. I mean, a headache. So, Sorry. Of course, Sandra <laughs> runs back to the museum at this point and is left ah! alone again. That's how she gets around so fast. She just runs everywhere in fear. A door gets slammed and the statue of Charles topples over. Guess what she does? More screaming. Okay, so this is the second time that Sandra's been alone in the museum and creepy shit has happened, okay? This is the second time. I'm not ruining anything. Everybody who's listening knows. Yeah. It's Charles and Linda. Yeah. Trying to make Sandra go crazy so, so she they can, can get power of so attorney. they can get power of attorney so he can control the whole business, right? We know that. So every time she's alone in the museum, it's because Alan has walked away for a second. Yeah. Right? He- 
Alan, who cares about her and is not doing anything bad to her. Alan seems complicit in everything, but it's purely accidental. So are Charles and Linda just hanging around outside the museum, constantly waiting for people to step away from Sandra? Well, you really, like, when you own a software company, you really don't need to, like, be there all the time. Even if that's the case, right? And he never has to be there. He can run it from a distance, whatever. He can do what he wants. He's the big boss. Wouldn't somebody notice him just like hanging from the rafters well, or whatever he's doing? considering in another doing? episode, in the, in the choir episode, they notice that somebody's listening at the window like instantaneously. Well, one of the two of them is just waiting in the museum for any opportunity to have Sandra alone so they can freak her out. Yeah. They're not luring her there like they do later. It's just weird. Sandra goes off to see Eleanor, and that word that the therapist used, madness, is that's an, an unword. unword too. Yep, it's an unword. She is the worst psychic ever. Because she says she doesn't actually talk to the ghosts. She yep. just imagines what they would say. So you guess, sort of. And this is in the graveyard at night. Yeah, <laughs> she's all right. <laughs> So the old guy sneaks into the museum old to get Marcus. Marcus to get his money. Bastards! Bastards! <laughs> you stole it! Because the grave is open and there's no goodies in there. And he gets killed. Marcus gets killed by a weapon that seems weird. It's you think maybe it's like a bust at the time. Something. It's yeah. No. We find out later. It's a that slide it's, projector. It's a slide projector. And we have some kind of retro AV equipment in our house. And I can say you could kill somebody with one of those cast iron cased pieces of AV equipment. But what I'm going to tell you is it would not work as well as it did. Not afterwards. No. Oh gosh, no. The bulb would definitely be broken at least. Eleanor and Sandra arrive and find the dead Marcus and I have to say maybe Jonathan Lowry is the best dead body in this episode <laughs> he's a pretty good corpse down there this is the turning point for me where I go from not liking Miss Bunsel to liking Miss Bunsel. I agree. Because Sandra's afraid to go in and she says, you know, God wallop, we're modern women. We fear nothing. Let's go. Yep, I do. I she's, like that. She's I like got her that. cape and she's going to go. Yep. George is back for this single scene. Yep. George's wife is more in this episode than George. They put George in the pit. Yep. He's got, he found some pennies in the leather bag and he got hit by the projector six times. Wow, Marcus's head is really tore up. Yeah. That is some serious damage. What are we going to do with Marcus's dog? Give him to Barnaby to take care of. I guess. I'm confused about something here. Yep. So Jim uses the metal detector. It goes off like crazy. Yep. But then the grave is open and we're kind of led to believe, oh, somebody got here first and stole the stuff. Because Ralph is interrupted before he gets the pennies. Right. He was just after the pennies. No, he was after the treasure, but... That's all the treasure I think that's in but there. But then everybody says, but there never was any treasure. There is no treasure. How do they know? Don't know. When it's gone. The treasure is forgetting, forgotten like halfway through. I just thought maybe I missed something. Because no. just because it's not there now it's doesn't weird. mean it wasn't. Yeah, it's weird. Okay. Rule seven, never use the indicator. Keeps other drivers on their toes. This is Troy's bad driving again. Yep. Nico's being nice. He's fixing Eleanor's inner tube. I don't think he has much of a choice. No, I don't. He ends up so. doing a bunch of other odd jobs for her too because they totally ditch him. And I love how she totally lies. She's like, I have insomnia, so sometimes I wander around graveyards. <laughs> she's Dead got, is an unword. She's got a, a spray can of CS gas in her bag. Yes. Which is tear gas. Yes, she got it at the World Cup. CS gas is an aerosol, a volatile sub- solvent. And 2-chlorobenzylarb, which is a compound at room temperature, it is non-lethal. It's tear gas. Yes, it's tear gas. It's the same tear gas they used at Waco. And it is illegal in the UK. Yeah, it's not illegal here. No. And the police can use it everywhere. Yes. But they don't. Yes. They're searching for his unkiller. When they leave Miss Bunsell's house. joke there. Yeah. When they leave Miss Bunsell's house, we get that awesome lady in the background who almost falls on her face. On the stairs. <laughs> she almost falls on her face. And it's clearly the sound of bottles as she walks. So it, do you think that's fully added afterwards? Or do you think that's actually the jangling of bottles in her back? I think they liked the take. They didn't realize that she had tripped. When they were watching it and editing, they added the foley of the bottles. What, to explain why she trips? Because she's I, drunk or I something? Ge- I guess. <laughs> but watch it. She trips. Oh, clearly. everybody on the internet has noticed that one. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Okay. It's it's a commonly known 
goof up in this episode. Okay. But it's still funny. It's hilarious. Because <laughs> she recovers very well. And they run into Alan and Charles, who are just like sitting there. They're just chatting in the garden. Because again, we've got one of those episodes where everybody lives remarkably close together. Yes. So they can walk from Miss Bunsell's garden down those public stairs, and then suddenly they're in Charlie's garden. Yeah. Alan thinks that... Um, Sanders being set up in yeah. some way, right? So he's he's kind of on to it. Charlie's like, no, 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 no. Nope. No. Nope. But he does admit that he was in the museum. She's being got at. Yeah. Jim and Annie are off. He doesn't want the police tramping on his old life. They have some kissy kiss. And then Jim comes home and basically finds... Ralph. Before that, we've got a good Troy line. They said, he says, they clobbered Marcus and they turned him into cat's meat. Yep. Like, they did sort of pulverize his head. Yeah. I'm with Troy on that one. That's a good line. Like the cat's meat. Poor Marcus. (laughs) He just wanted some treasure. Yeah, Jim (laughs) wants to go to France with Annie before Barnaby's on to him. Because he knows that, Ralph knows that he's the banker for George Burton. Yeah. So who Let's talk about Ralph a little bit, just for yeah. a second. So Ralph's in the basement of the museum. Yep. Because he wants to get at the treasure. No. Because I, he's escaped from prison. Yes. So he's hiding, and he's Annie's ex. So he hears about the treasure, so he tries to get it then. But then later, when they arrest him, he talks about Alan. He talks about Sandra. Well, he's lived in the neighborhood forever. So he knows everybody. He knows everybody. So he's one of the Aspern Tallow people. Yeah. So who did he kill? I don't know. To go away for manslaughter. I don't know. Because you think that would have been a previous episode. You you would think, yeah. <laughs> Maybe somebody else investigated it. Maybe. Yeah, so Jim was four inches banker. Yeah. And then... There's a fight. Jim and Ralph have a big fight. It's a it's super fight. He smacks him on the head with a bottle, and yeah. they roll around the living room, and they break the coffee table, and they trash the place. And we never see Jim again. Nope. Tom and Troy and Nico are out for breakfast. And just when you thought the whole people trying to control Tom and treat him like a child is over, Nico says, well, I can get you breakfast too, sir. And I won't tell anybody at home. Yeah, like, I didn't like that line at all. I didn't either. Tom has a coffee, but the sense I get, or at least what I want to get, is that that's all he wanted. And And if he wanted something else, he'd have it. While they're driving around the country, they run into Annie and her purse. Her giant bag. In which we see some herring. Mackerel! Dun, dun, dun! Dun, dun, dun! Jim's house is wrecked. <laughs> Who carries around mackerel in their bag? It's not, it, is it me or is it like tissues, a wallet, some keys, some lipstick and mackerel? Yeah. It's not like milk, oranges, apples, mackerel in that bag. Yeah. It's like her purse. It's weird. She's keeping fish in her purse. She's obsessed with fish. Jim, uh, his house is wrecked and they have no idea where he is and everybody forgets about it for a couple of scenes. Yeah. Well, Nico finds the four inch clippings. Yep. And they're like, hmm, maybe there's a connection. Sandra decides she doesn't want to work on the painting in the museum anymore. So they go, she and Charlie go to pick it up. Yep. And they realize maybe someone is in the basement. Yeah. Normal police procedure, I realize, would be to call PC Angel. And Mm. we'll be like, Angel, go down in there and get beat up. Yeah, your uniform. Go down there. No, no. no, They just head on down. It's it's just weird. I, (laughs) I just keep thinking about Ralph being down in this basement with a view. Like, he can see everything that's going on from the basement. And he's just eating one fish sandwich after another the whole time. Where does he go to the loo? I don't know, but he's eating so much fish that they can smell it upstairs. (laughs) That's a lot of fish. (laughs) It's a ghost with a weakness for fish. Yes. (laughs) We get another rule here. Rule 24, don't expect any sympathy. (laughs) That's what Troy says. Because Ralph smacks him on the hand with a shovel. And he hits Tom, too. Tom in the arm. Like... Really hard. Yeah. Though George's wife, Kathy, the doctor, says it's fun. So I didn't think she was a doctor. I thought in the episode where it's all about her practice that Mm. she was the admin. Oh, no, she's a doctor. No, she's a doctor. They're both doctors. Yep. Yeah. And she says that, hey, you know, speaking of Sandra, her therapist, Linda Marquis, you might want to check on her. She might be known to the police. Could you drive someone over the edge? Troy says, I'm living proof. (laughs) After he's done, like, snogging the nurse in the waiting room or something. Yeah, like, uh, Troy's on the make here. Hey, baby. Yeah. And then we get this epically awesome scene with Mrs. Bunzel talking about Sandra's diet. (laughs) 
Just when you think Miss Bunsell is a down-to-earth person, she doesn't tolerate all this craziness. She's she's kind of like a, a snap out of it, get over it, sister, move on. You can do this kind of person. She she goes into this like you know it could be your diet. You know some foods are bad for your moods. For example, spinach is depressing. Tell f- that to Popeye. But fennel is uplifting. Uplifting. I, I have a note here which says, um, Jim is still missing. No <laughs> one paying attention to that. And, you know, and I looked it up. Oh, gosh. In the long history of the weird Google searches I do in research for this show. Well, maybe there is a belief that certain foods are, you know, like holistic, like vegan kind of stuff. Maybe, maybe certain vegetables are better. Come to find out, spinach is actually something that doctors recommend for people who have depression because it contains a lot of magnesium, which can actually help your body boost serotonin levels. <laughs> so which is why Popeye is so chipper. Yep. Right? But it's the opposite of depressing. Nope. It's spinach not depressing at all. Depressing. Charlie does all the cooking where he puts all the drugs in it. <laughs> And then Barnaby sends everybody out to commit some crimes. Well, no, before that, we got the cellar dweller's gear. Oh, that's right. <laughs> None of this is legal. So no. Well, there's Tro- no Troy name in does it. does his housebreaking, right? They check, yeah. they check. None of it is checked in, uh, in evidence. There's a donkey jacket. Do you know what a donkey jacket is? Isn't it like a rainproof jacket? It's a medium length workwear jacket, typically made of unlined black or blue thick melton woolen fabric with shoulders and back and front reinforced to protect you from the rain. Yeah. So it's usually leather or It's PVC. like a farmer's jacket. Yeah. Yeah. It's what you typically see hunters wearing in the UK. And of course, I had to look at all the posters, <laughs> including racism. Don't let it smear you. You like, got some racism on me. Yuck. I got racism on me. <laughs> and bombs, be aware. <laughs> Are but you aware of bombs? The yes, hands in the pocket jacket from the last episode is in there too. Yeah, it's still there. Yeah, it's really just all, all the sets are exactly the same. The, um, the, the, the dressing of the set at the station house is always good though. They do such a good job. You know who cares about where Jim is? Annie. No, not really. In her a million jobs. <laughs> she doesn't really care How where Jim is. How many jobs does she have? She's a house cleaner and a barmaid. Okay. That's it. But she's meticulous because she keeps her receipts pinned to a bulletin board in her house. That Troy breaks into. Yeah, to get it. So here's my problem with Annie, right? Okay. We know that in a second, Ralph is going to be crashing at Jim's house hiding out. Yeah. Right? Because he's escaped from prison. They're escaped after from prison. And he's a tech two policeman. Yeah. So not only has she been bringing him fish in the basement of the museum, but she obviously said you can stay at Jim's house. She knows and, he's at Jim's and house. And I think she probably filled it in that Jim had a past. Well, Ralph and Jim got in a fight, right? Yeah. And then we don't see Jim again. So yeah. Ralph may have killed Jim, and then he's hiding out in Jim's house, and Annie knows it. Yeah, it's... And she could easily do something about it, but she doesn't. He threatened to kill me. Yeah, I'm not buying that. Yeah. I think she still has a soft spot for a fish sandwich. That's what I think. Uh, I think that that's definitely a possibility. Yeah. Because if she... If so who would she you She doesn't send... know Jim's dead at that point. So why is it okay for so him to hang out at Jim's house? who would you send to Jim's house? Oh, Kali and Nico. Oh, okay. They're highly experienced. Illegal. Yes. But the cops are coming. They do have a blue light that goes on top of their car. Yeah, but then Ralph steals it. <laughs> and when just Ralph a car. when Ralph steals the car, the light's gone. Yeah. Well he pulls it in. Well, wouldn't you? You think. I mean, if you're gonna steal a car, you don't wanna have flesh and blues on it, right? But the next morning, no Nico allowed. Nope. You're gonna see Barnaby's dark side. Yep. Now it's getting serious. It's gonna go talk to Linda Marquis. Because they see Charles leaving. Yeah, because it was, was an all-night therapy session. I was very upset, too. So upset, I did some rumpy bumpy. Now, there's this, <laughs> a scene I had to watch three times on the way to Linda's house. Okay. Tom and Troy are in the car, speeding away like they usually yes. do. Yes, you told me this. And there's this little bend in the road. Okay, so I'm Troy. I'm driving. Right? The roads are already narrow. Not They're using little country my, roads. Not using my indicator. Don't use your turn signal. Don't use the brake pedal. Go around this bend where two detached houses have their front doors inches from the road. Yeah, like maybe a foot stoop. Maybe. Maybe. 
Like, if you stepped out of your house, flat, Troy would run you over. Dead. I've never seen houses that close to the street before. Yeah, that's with no just sidewalk, a little too, no nothing. That's a little too close. I, I have to think that the road was put in after the houses were built. Yeah. Because <laughs> otherwise, somebody was really bad at building houses. <laughs> just... Can we move it a little bit further back from the road? No, 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 no. no. You'll be, be fine. fine. <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> There's a curb. It'll be fine. It's a full 11 inches. Yeah. <laughs> That's what the council says. <laughs> and then... When they get outside Linda's house, there's this weird food conversation again where Troy claims, Tom claims, that you can only have four fried eggs a week. Yo, wh- where does that number come from? Why and, four? And, like, why doesn't he just say, Troy, can I have a bit of your sandwich? Because obviously <laughs> that's what he wants. <laughs> you can only have four fried eggs a week. That should be one of the rules. Should be. Yeah. So they go see Linda, who we find some dark secrets out about Linda. Heroin chic. Other than being in... I think probably human league, human league, other than being in the human league. (laughs) And I guess that we hadn't talked about that. (laughs) She definitely looks like that girl from human league. (laughs) Absolutely. I was a waitress in a restaurant and then a therapist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Apparently she's got an arrest for some drugs. She's had some issues two years ago, but she gave it up two years ago. And then Barnaby says more power to your elbow or just above it. Yeah, so what does that mean? You know I looked it up. Yes, you did. Now, you've heard more power to you. Like, yep. go on, sister, more power to you. Yeah. Do that thing. Yes, do it. More power to your elbow is a bit more specific. I found a reference in a UK newspaper from 1922. Wow. Where someone wrote in to ask about the phrase, more power to your elbow. Oh. And what the origin was. It goes back to the 1760s uh, in Ireland, okay. where there were two kinds of bagpipes. <laughs> this is not going where I thought it was And going. one was called a Uleen pipe. Yeah. And relied far more on your elbow to squeeze the bag. And so when somebody played that bagpipe well, people would say, more power to your elbow. It's Scottish, right? Yeah. So maybe it's a Moira thing. No, it's not. Yes. Because she's Scottish. Scottish. No, it's Irish. Oh, then I have no idea. More power to your elbow. But she drops a secret too. Or just above it, because that's where you shoot up your heroin. Yes. She drops a secret that Alan and Sandra were an item. Again, totally red herring, right? Linda's so, just like, don't look at me. Look at somebody else. It's not me. They go to Alan Bradford's labyrinth. He has a fantastic labyrinth. He does. And Alan admits that though he tried to love Sandra and he cares about her a lot. His heart wasn't in it. He plays for the other team. Yeah. Neither do I. He's a cavalier. Tro- Troy's not gay. Not around. I'm not gay. He's a cavalier. Let's leave. Not a roundhead. Let's leave right now. Do you know why Cavalier was a a euphemism for gay? No. Because in the Civil War, the Cavaliers, who were the Royalists, were still wearing the long curly wigs. Ah. And the flouncy buckled shoes and stuff. I can see that. And the roundheads were the parliamentarians. They had their hair cut really short. They wore more workman type uniforms. And they just weren't. They weren't as fancy. I never doubted it, Gavin. Yeah. Gavin. Gavin. I love that Alan calls him Gavin. He says it a couple of times. It's it's almost as good as Annie's wink ah, ah, with half of her face. Sandra's leaving everything to her sister in Canada. Yeah, all $10 million. I got to say, Canada is like the easiest thing for British people to use in shows. It's 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 incredibly far away, but not America. It's incredibly far away, but not corrupt like America is. Right. Or crazy like America is. Miss Bunsen... The good colonists. (laughs) Miss Bunsen should go to every funeral. Yes. Because she adds excitement. Vicar, halt! Bring it up! Let me point my hands. Uh, I point my fingers. No, never mind. No! Get it up! Get it up! Into the hole, Troy. (laughs) Poor Troy has to jump down in that grave. Now... I know Jim's buried under some dirt in there. But he would have had to land on Jim. But he landed right on Jim. (laughs) And Jim plays a good corpse. He does. He's like solid as a rock. Now, I don't know where he's actually lying down when they do the close-up of his face with the dirt. But the dirt is like right up to hit the corner of his eyes. Yeah. It's all over his face. So he, and and there's no soil movement from breathing. He does a really good job. He does. It's really good. Jim Tate is in the hole. And he's so upset. I don't know about that, though. I think you're right. And he's she's, talking out of both sides of her mouth. She's got to know he's dead. Yeah. Otherwise, why would she let Ralph hang out at his house? The dog, speaking of houses, is in Tom's chair. Yeah, but Angel's going to come get it, so it's okay. 
And then Nico has another wave of brilliance. Yep, he finds out that James Tate is actually Whistler, who is... Four inches accountant. Four inches accountant. How Nico found that out when the actual police people hadn't put it together yet. Nico's amazing. You know who's bad at trying to escape? Ralph. Ralph. He goes to Hull and tries to hop on a ship. Yeah, <laughs> I'm getting out of here, coppers. Well, maybe not. But he has a very high opinion of Sandra. It's not him. He's not doing anything to her. What about the two dead people? Yeah. All they're concerned about is who's bothering Sandra. Yes. <laughs> like, okay, she's unstable and a bit crazy. Two people are dead. Yes. That we have bodies. But who's bothering Sandra? Speaking of Sandra, she's back at the museum again. Don't leave her alone. Oh, we left her alone. Charles has a meeting. He's got heaps of things for her to sign. Yeah. Like the David Delighted Depart- Departed slide, maybe? No. Now, Sandra gets scared. <laughs> what does she do? What does she do? Hmm. Screamy, screamy, runny, runny. <laughs> I'm not buying this projector thing. It's very Scooby-Doo. Oh, it's super Scooby-Doo. She would totally see. I mean, I know she's not completely well, with plus, it. Plus, it's like a 1950s projector, so the fans on those things. Like, and it's so, been whacked against the guy's head a yeah, couple of times. Yeah. So. Like, it should have little blood driplets. <laughs> I'm just wondering how Charlie made that slide. PowerPoint. He he does run a software software company. company. It looks like it's been drawn with a marker it's on just a piece of plastic. Back at the cop shop, Cass shows up and basically spills all the beans. Sandra's having a breakdown. You should probably go check on her. Yeah. <laughs> She's losing her shit again. And Barnaby calls her and there's this weird scene by the lake where he basically tells her everything. He needs to get her alone so they can plot together to set up yeah. Linda and Charlie. And for once, Sandra is sensible. Yes. And says, ah. Oh. She goes in with the plan, right? And yeah. the plan is to go see Linda and to convince them to try to really freak her out. So they can catch them trying to make Sandra feel crazy. Which, what do you know? Linda says, why don't we meet tonight at the museum after dark? Strangely And enough. I'll show you that nothing's going on. <gasps> the lights aren't working. How weird. A figure approaches. And then Sandra says it's David. Did her husband hang out in a cloak? I guess so. <laughs> it's like totally over the top gaslighting of her. It's a male human. It's David. It's, I he's don't in, see her. He's in the I painting. I don't see anything. He's in the painting. He's that guy in a cloak. He's Tom. Nico is David. Everybody's who's, David. Who's not David? Yeah, and I Linda's don't like, see what? what? I don't see anything. Oh, it's such it's it. She's good at acting badly. Yeah. So Troy shows up, and Barnaby shows up, and <laughs> Barnaby like, gives him a sword. Go run him through. <laughs> and, and Troy's like all all for it. He's oh, like, yeah. oh, I get to stab somebody to death. <laughs> <laughs> Governor told me to do it. <laughs> and then Charlie's like, wait, wait, don't don't kill me. Yeah. <laughs> So they take them to the cop shop and they put them in an interrogation room together and they leave them alone. I know. Leaving two suspects together in a room alone is illegal. It's not illegal. It's dumb. It's just dumb. (laughs) But, you know, if they start to, you know, conspire together, it's not like they can't hear them or watch them because there is a, a cop in the room. Yeah. So they couldn't kill her because they wanted to get all of the company and they didn't want to go to the sister in Canada. Mark, it was just a joke that it's got just out of hand. A joke. Just a joke. Mrs. Needle Features. Miss Needle Features. Yeah, Troy calls Linda Miss Needle Features. That's I've... not the name of the woman in the human league. No. And I looked it up and the only thing I could find was that Maybe it means that your face is kind of harsh and pointy. Yeah. But I think it's a reference to heroin. I think it's... I I think think Troy's making stuff up. I think Troy's (laughs) doing double duty here. He's saying she's ugly and she did the needles. And she did drugs. Yeah. So the idea is that when Sandra was in rehab two years ago, she held back some medication that was a, quote, mind bender, and they've been slipping it to Sandra all this time. And that drug is salazapan. Which is an animal anesthetic. Number one, you don't give it to people going through rehab. And number two, if you're giving a patient in rehab drugs that strong and they need to take it, you don't just give them the pills so they can hoard them. You make sure you take them. Yeah. Right? But did Linda plan this two years in advance? No, I guess she just kept it 
bunch of salazapan around just in case. But it's a veterinary anesthetic. Yeah, they show no, like, Charles and her meeting. and There's no conspiring. So she was saving him up just to save him up? I guess. Sometimes you feel like an animal tranquilizer. <laughs> just... Just in case? Just pop one with a bunch of wine at night. Well, apparently, amongst all the other problems that the countryside has, they have a salazepam problem. People are slipping each other animal tranquilizers because Barnaby slaps that cost in health flyer on the table, and yep. it's right there. Salazepam. Heroin right there. and coke and LSD. Yeah. It's right there on the list. And opiates. So maybe it's because farm kids abuse it? I guess. <laughs> I don't know. So they finally split them up, and they take Linda in the hallway, and she runs into Sandra. Yeah. Which we, they never do that. Like It could happen in a small station like that. It I could guess. happen. It could happen. Sandra should have, like, punched her in the face, though. I think so. That would have been awesome. Because she's like, you had everything thrown your way. Sandra did nothing wrong. No, but you're pretty, and you have money, and I just wanted a little bit of it. Well, then try not to be, like... A drugging, scheming, lying lady. Yeah. Hmm. Charlie and Ralph both both point the finger at each other. Like, you yep. buried him. No, you buried him. Yep. You buried him. <laughs> it's totally, you did it. No, I did it. No, you did it. Yeah. But they believe Ralph. And what happens is they need to find the projector. Yeah. Because Ralph says that Charles killed Marcus with the, with, proje- the, with the projector. But where is it now? So Troy goes to search his house. Everybody goes everybody to else. search the house. It so could be anywhere people, now. Somebody could have just thrown it away in the trash. The people in the house are Troy, mm-hmm. Nico, mm-hmm. Sandra, mm-hmm. and Alan Bradford. Mm-hmm. Looking for evidence. Evidence. Offhand, Nico goes, it could be anywhere, even in that skip over there. They run over and look in the skip, and they find it. And what did they do? <laughs> they touch it with their hands. We know police procedure has not been maintained during this episode. <laughs> Barnaby goes, it has bits of Marcus on it, to which I said, I added, and Nico. <laughs> Well, I think Nico has bits of Marcus on him now. Yeah, exactly. And they find the watch in Ralph's clothes. So Ralph killed Jim and, and Charlie Charles killed, killed Marcus. Marcus. The dog the, end. the dog is not staying <laughs> in the house because who's coming to pick up the dog? Kevin. Kevin? What's Kevin? Kevin Angel. Oh, he lives with mom. Or he's going to give the dog to his mom. Maybe. I don't know if it's clear he lives with her. But he's been off sick. Yeah. Because he ate the mackerel. <laughs> The evidentiary mackerel. (laughs) Page three of the Daily Mail, which is a big thing, but wow, I don't think the Daily Mail has proofreaders. No. Well, and it's funny because I think the rest of the paper is actually real. And there's just this one sheet in the inside where Barnaby opens it just to that fold. Yeah. And here's the story about the aspirin Haunted Museum Killers. Police charge men in killing in... Aspen Tallow. They misspelled aspirin towel. Aspirin. Not aspirin. Aspirin. <laughs> aspirin. Not aspirin. <laughs> a candle made out of tallow would burn your ass. And I did notice that the article has like words in it. It's not just like... Lorem Ipsum or something. Lorem Ipsum text. It's pretty good. And then they do the thing that I hate. I just, the episode should end right there. Yeah, but they've got to have the... Or was it... You had the creepy chair creeping and creeping. So are we supposed to believe that Jonathan Lowry, the Cavalier, sat in a rocking chair all the time? I I don't know. It's just dumb. Did rocking chairs exist then? I don't know. It's just dumb. I tried to find out when rocking chairs were invented. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And the history of rocking chairs is a bit unclear. One source I found. I'm sorry, it's just so stupid now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> One source I found said, hypothesized that the rocking chair originated from chairs with uneven legs. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody realized that teetering on a chair was kind of enjoyable and then built a chair purposely built for that. And ghosts. And too. ghosts like to rock them. They do. <laughs> with fishing line that you can sort of see in the upper right hand corner in the sunlight you can sort of see the fishing line jiggle in that chair a couple of questions at the end of this episode jim is dead yeah and he's not married to him no jim has no children no where does all his money and houses go 
Yeah. Well, and where is his money, right? Yeah. Because there's the question of where he hid the money and why he thinks people are going to come and kill him. Like, there's definitely some moolah there that if, if Annie was as skeezy as we think she is, she should have been married to him, like, in a second. Yeah. And some disappointed gangsters who might have tried to hunt him down at some point to get the money and then found out that some software guy killed him. Yes. No. Yep. Some basement-dwelling fish eater killed yes. him. <laughs> Then another question I have, of course, is what does that software company do? We'll never know. Because I have no idea. They ne- It's just software company. It's probably some proprietary accounting software. There's an episode coming up in like season 10 or 11, I think, or 12 called The Glitch, mm-hmm. which they go into a software company and it's, it's much better. Yeah, it gets better. It's not perfect, but it's better. But this episode is, it's awesome for... Miss Bunsell, she's an awesome yeah. character. I wish she would come back. Yeah. I wish I, she was in other episodes. I really liked her. I really like the whole kind of ghost story thing and it that whole Scooby Doo plot. Yeah. Of, and then know, Troy uh Barnaby solves it all. I like that. Yeah, I did too. And and I think he's uh he and Troy are great. They're both great in this episode. They're perfect for their like little character boxes that yep. they're supposed to play. And And Nico's great. He is And good. we never see him again. Well, we don't really need to. I mean, I think this is like the best he can be. Yeah, I think so. You know, it's the most he can contribute. Yeah. And we need more rules. I do wish that we had heard all of the rules. Yeah. But... Maybe we'll ask you. Maybe that'll be the question this week I post. What other rules should there be for playing a constable? Yeah, because we get... Playing a DS. Sorry. What rules do we get? We get one, two, seven, and 24. Yeah. And that's it? Yeah, that's it. We get four rules. So what are all the other rules? I don't know. What should they be? Hmm. You tell us. Sleep (laughs) naked. What else does Troy do? Collect comic books, but we don't know that yet. Flirt with witnesses. Flirt with witnesses. Yeah. You should always do that. And you should always steal the governor's candy from the glove box. Uh, Try to... To get tell the governor what to eat. But I bet you the folks listening are going to come up with much better rules. Absolutely. The sergeant's rules. So corpse of the episode. I got to say it's Jim Tate. Jim Tate, without a doubt. He's covered in dirt, doesn't move a stitch. Marcus's head wound is epic. It is. And Jonathan Lowry is a pretty cool corpse. Yep. But I got to give it to Jim Tate because, wow, yeah. With the loose soil and everything, he doesn't breathe. he does a great job. He was in a movie called The Monster Club in 1981 with Vincent Price. I've seen that movie. Of course you have, James Lawrenson. Yeah, I give give James Lawrenson, a.k.a. James Tate, the best corpse of the episode. Nice. So, Midsummer Maniacs is on Twitter and Instagram, at Midsummer Maniac. Go to any of these places and tell us what are the other 21 rules. And I'll post it on the Facebook group of both Acorn and Midsummer Murders. Maybe we can make the complete list. Maybe. Well, if we get more of them, we'll post a list. That would be sure. awesome. Absolutely. Again, happy birthday to John Nettles. 75, man. And you look you, you look great. Yeah. He does. He's awesome. Yep. Next episode is season four, episode one. And I got to tell you, I was looking over season four today. Oh, There's we got six, some good ones. Six episodes of Bonkers. Yeah. It is six it's fantastic coming, baby. episodes. Crazy, crazy. And we start with Garden of Death. Mm, tune in next time for Garden of Death, who, maniacs. And, and who who is... The gardener in Garden of Death? He looks sort of like a Barnaby. Mm. He must be a distant relation. Yes, Neil Dudgeon. (laughs) Playing a young, sexy gardener. Yes, and selling hooch out of his hut. Yeah, well, why not? Yeah. So tune in next time for that. Bye, maniacs. Bye, maniacs.
so and and they had they had i'm saying so like you usually say so have you infected me with your so my notes say stop saying so so i stopped it oh well mine don't because i didn't used to say it thanks um i'll say um instead um 